As George Washington begins his first term of office, the United States makes its temporary capital in New York City. Eventually, we will settle on a permanent capital for the United States. Now, Washington was an excellent selection for our first president. He is here to serve the United States, not himself. He would have much preferred to have gone home and retired, but he's here because he's been asked to serve his country. Americans will respect his leadership, and so he is a great choice for our first president. Everything he does is going to be a precedent, meaning he's going to set the example that other presidents will follow. And it's, uh, it's very important, the uh, fact that he understands that everything he does is going to set an example. So he is very thoughtful and careful in making the choices that he makes as president. Now, first of all, he will have to uh, choose a cabinet, uh, people to lead his government. First of all, we had the Secretary of State, that's our head diplomat, and he chose Thomas Jefferson for this job. He had experience as a diplomat to France and was a very good choice. As Secretary of the Treasury, he selected Alexander Hamilton. The choice of Hamilton as our Secretary of Treasury is especially important because he is going to set the United States uh, on the path to really being the modern uh, government and economy that we have today. And uh, as much as I personally don't like Hamilton, um, he does do a good job with getting us off on a, to a good start in many ways. But as head of the War Department, he chose his former general, Henry Knox. Now, Knox ends up being kind of the yes man on, man on the cabinet. Hamilton and Jefferson would have a bitter opinion about everything and often fight with each other. But Knox would kind of sit back and see which way Washington was leaning and just generally kind of advise whatever he thought Washington wanted to hear. He really only had a strong opinion about the things that he felt like were his jurisdiction, which had to do with the War Department. Otherwise, he didn't really have strong opinions. Now, Washington did set a precedent when he decided to expand the government. We only had three departments, but Washington created a new department. Uh, because his job was to enforce the law, and because he did not consider himself a legal expert, he wanted someone to be the attorney general. Initially, the job was to help him understand the law so that he would be sure he was enforcing it correctly. So he chose uh, Edmund Randolph of Virginia to be his first attorney general. And of course, that created a whole new department in the government, and we've been expanding ever since. Now, the most important two members of his cabinet are Hamilton and Jefferson, because they will become the uh, basis, their ideas will become the basis for our two-party system. See, we originally we didn't plan on having two political parties. In fact, we didn't plan on political parties. But very quickly, we have two opinions, two uh, ideologies that are forming in America, which become what we will call the Federalists. That will be Hamilton's party, and he, John Adams, and others will be of that uh, way of thinking. And then the Jeffersonians, or uh, they called themselves Republicans back then. We sometimes call them the Democratic Republicans because this party ultimately will evolve into the modern Democratic Party. Now, Hamilton and his Federalists are going to be uh, have certain aspects that or what they believe in, what they stand for. First of all, Hamilton, as the Secretary of the Treasury, is very concerned about business. So his party will support industrialization. They will support the growth of American business, and they will be very much in favor of defending American businesses, helping to develop our economy. The growth of a modern, industrialized America is very much thanks to Hamilton and his party. Jefferson, on the other hand, uh, the Democratic Republicans, they, they're really more rural. They're more, uh, Jefferson believes in this being a, an agricultural country. He believes that's a much more moral lifestyle. He doesn't like the idea of uh, big business and big cities. He, he believes in this 
agricultural sort of lifestyle and believes that's what America is destined to be. So he sees us as a nation of farmers. Now, not surprisingly, big businessmen will like the Federalist Party. Farmers and later working class people who work for those big businessmen, often for long hours and low pay, they will tend to go with the Democratic Republicans. Now, the Northeast will be the main area. It's where the industrialized cities are, and that, that'll be the haunt of the Federalists. The South and rural areas will tend to lean towards Jeffersonians. Now, in the world back then, you had to make a choice. There were two superpowers. There were the English and there were the French, and they were constantly at war. And um, so we've got to buddy up to one side or the other. You didn't really get the choice of being friends with both. They wouldn't let you. So being in favor of big business and trade, Hamilton and the Federalists preferred to ally with Great Britain because this was the industrialized nation that we had modeled ourselves after. We wanted to engage in trade with them. And so, and they also feared the anarchy of the French Revolution. Meanwhile, Jefferson and his party, they like the idealism that they see in France. They see our revolution and our Enlightenment ideas continuing there, and they want to ally with France. Now, there'll be one other big issue which we're going to see pop up, and that's this idea of how to interpret the Constitution. Do we strictly follow what the Constitution says by the letter of the law, or do we stretch it? Do we go with the spirit of the Constitution and extend the power of the federal government? Jefferson and his party were afraid that the federal government would get too big, too powerful, overreach, and they wanted to go very strictly by the Constitution. This is called strict constructionism. On the other hand, Hamilton and his party felt like the federal government needed to exercise authority more broadly and that they could expand the uh, Constitution. And in a second, we'll see how this uh, becomes their ideology. So first of all, under Washington's administration, one of the first things we've got to do is get our economy off to a good start. And Hamilton has been charged with this task. And there's a few things Hamilton wants to do. Number one, he wants to pay off our debt completely to establish good credit. We've got to pay off the individuals and the nations and everyone we owe money to. That's both the federal debt and also the state debts. He wants to pay off the debt of New York, the debt of Massachusetts, the debt of Virginia. Now we run into a problem here. He wants to use our federal taxes to pay off state debts. Now he feels like that's good for the country, but some states had actually already paid their debt. States like Virginia had paid their debt. And they don't want to collect more taxes to pay off Massachusetts debt. So we have a problem here. They're not going to want to go for this plan. Um, also, should we redeem the continental dollars? Now, continentals were the money that we paid, uh, the paper money we paid our soldiers with and used during the revolution. Those had been, uh, high, there was high inflation with those. Nobody trusted them. Nobody was sure we would win the revolution and that money would be worth anything. And uh, continental dollars had never been worth much. And unfortunately, our soldiers had been paid in continental dollars. But um, Hamilton says, all right, it's time that we redeem this money. Buy these dollars back, pay for them in full with, our, uh, with more modern currency, and uh, redeem the val full value of these continentals. Now, there was a uh, outcry against doing this because what had happened, a lot of the soldiers, uh, because the money was worth nothing and they had bills to pay, people had come along and they had bought up the Continentals at, uh, at just minimal value. A business guy would come along and say, hey, soldier, uh, I'll buy $100 worth of your Continentals for five bucks. And they would do it because the Continentals were worthless. But now, they're going to make a big profit off of it. And the people that you know, the soldiers that had been paid, um, they're getting cheated here. And some people didn't want to do that. But Hamilton said, no, that's exactly what we've got to do. We've got to reward entrepreneurs who took that business risk and invested that money. That's what we want in America. So he wants to pay that off. Now, it mostly kind of comes down to sectional lines. Southerners are against Hamilton's plan. 
So they end up cutting a deal. In the end, the Southerners are going to vote for this in exchange for the North agreeing that if they'll vote for this plan, then we will establish our capital in the South. And so eventually what's going to happen is we are going to have uh, Virginia and Maryland donate a little sliver of land right along the Potomac River on either side of their, uh, their state borders, and they're going to create a new area, the District of Columbia, which will become the uh, location of our nation's capital, which will be Washington, D.C. Now, the next thing he has to do is he wants to establish a national bank. He feels like this would be good. We will have print national money through this bank. They will also be where we will store our taxes that we collect, and they can give loans to help uh, American businesses grow, which is what Hamilton wants to do. Jefferson said, yeah, that's all right and fine, but the Constitution didn't say we can have a national bank, and strict construction, no bank. If it's not the Constitution, you don't do it. But Hamilton says, yeah, but it's good for the country. We need to do it. So Washington hears them both argue about it, and Washington says, all right, guys, homework. You guys come back with your reasons why we should or should not have the bank. And they both came back with the exact same clause of the Constitution as their argument. Article 1, Section 8 says that the government can make all laws which shall be necessary and proper. And so this is sometimes known as the necessary and proper clause. Now, Jefferson argued, eh, it might be proper, but it is not necessary. And it is not. We do not have a national bank today. He says this is not necessary, therefore we cannot do it. But Hamilton goes, yeah, but it, it's the right thing to do. It's, it's proper. And we should have a bank. And ultimately, Washington sided with Hamilton, mainly because this was a financial issue. But by doing so, we've established this precedent of using this clause, which is sometimes called the elastic clause, to stretch the power of the federal government. And so ever since then, the government's been getting bigger and bigger. So Hamilton wins here. Now, the one thing Hamilton isn't quite able to do is he wants to get higher tariffs. Tariffs are taxes on goods from other countries. And what you do is, like, you have a hat in America and a hat in Britain. But you put the tax on the British hat, so it's more, now more expensive and people will buy the American hat. Um, so tariffs are often protective. They help encourage people to buy American-made things. And he wants to have these tariffs. But the South, um, because they're not making products in the South, instead they're exporting their cotton, they don't want to put taxes on goods from other countries and maybe see uh, penalties put on American goods going overseas. So the South tends to be against tariffs. And ultimately, he's not able to get this through Congress. But he gets most of his program through. But the big thing, globally, that people are looking at during this time period is what's going on in France. See those French soldiers that came over here to America and helped us win our war? They went back over to France with ideas that maybe it would be good to get rid of the king. And ultimately, they did, and they chopped off his head. And France plunged into a revolution of their own, but they didn't have the background that we Americans did in British parliamentary government, which had prepared us for democracy. And so it becomes a madhouse over there. They go through a reign of terror. Eventually, we're going to see uh, several different versions of the government created and fail. And ultimately, a fellow by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte will rise to power and make himself the emperor. So democracy uh, will not run smoothly in France. But while this is going on, France has cut off a king's head, and all the other kings in Europe got nervous. So they all ganged up on France. But France was the big enough country that they could take on, especially with a general like Napoleon, they could take on all of Europe. And Napoleon and the French start winning and taking over Europe. Now, England, they're the naval power, so they can protect their own country and they can threaten French possessions around the world. But on the continent, the French have the power. And so there's a war going on, and we're caught in between. And so this is why we can trade with France, or we can trade with England. But if we trade with France, England's going to get mad. If we trade with England, France gets mad. We try to have it both ways, but it's just hard to do. 
Now, the French are trying to win us over to their side. And in fact, we had the Franco-American Treaty with France, uh, which they had signed with us during our revolution. But Washington knows we don't want to really live up to it and fight for France in this war. We don't have the power. We don't have the money. It would be bad for our country to jump into this war. So Washington's kind of looking for a way out. Ultimately, he kind of has a way out. We made the treaty with the guy whose head is now in a basket. So you could say this new French government is not the government we had signed the treaty with. And so Washington does not live up to this agreement, but France is trying to get us to. They're trying to get us on their side. In fact, when they sent their ambassador, a fellow known as Citizen Genet, uh, when he comes to America, he doesn't go straight to New York like he should. Instead, he lands down in the South where there's friendly uh, Jeffersonians. And he starts building their support to try to pressure Washington to side with France. And he also starts handing out letters of marquee. That's licenses for American ships to, under a license from the French, go out and attack British trade ships. Basically, he's trying to get us to fight for France, which could get us in trouble with England. So by the time this guy finally shows up in New York, Washington is furious with him. And he kicked him out of the country. He sent him back to France and said, no, you're not pulling this mess. So relations with France are getting kind of choppy. Now, we still have kind of a treaty with France that, yeah, we're not going to follow it, but it's still kind of there. Washington wants to make a treaty with Britain to try to ease uh, tensions with them. And so Washington sent uh, Jay to England to make a treaty with them. And we go to England, we say, hey, England, we really want to be friends with you. Will you promise to stop attacking our ships going to France if we have a treaty? And England says, ha, no, we're going to stop your ships. We say, please, no, we're going to stop your ships. Well, will you at least say you're our friend? Yeah, I'll be your friend, but I'm going to stop your ships. And we said, fine, we just want a treaty. It was the wimpiest treaty we ever signed. We're losers. We're just saying, you can beat us up, but please say you're our friend. But we were doing it to try to keep ourselves out of a war with France. So it's the weakest treaty we ever make, but it's uh, made in an order to try to keep peace with England, which is what Washington is after. He's trying to keep us out of foreign wars. Now at home, Washington's going to have to deal with a couple of problems. One, we are now collecting taxes. And one of the taxes we put in place is what you call a sin tax. We're going to tax something that we consider to be a a questionable product, whiskey. Now, the problem with whiskey is if you were a farmer on the western side of the Appalachian Mountains, um, you grew a lot of corn, and you couldn't load all that corn into wagons and haul it over the mountains to sell it. So what you did was you mashed it into liquor, and then you l took your liquor, which was more valuable than your ears of corn, in a wagon across the mountains and sold it. That was how they sold their crops. So when we targeted whiskey as a uh, taxable item, the farmers out west in Pennsylvania felt like they were being unfairly targeted. And so, being Americans, complaining about taxes, they rebelled, grabbed their guns, and they were ready to go. But it's George Washington's job to enforce the law. And this is the first time the federal government is being challenged. So Washington kind of overreacted. He called up 20,000 troops, um, and he sent them across the mountains to go crush this rebellion. Of course, when they showed up, everybody had put their guns away, and they are saying, I'm not rebelling. Are you rebelling? No, we're not rebelling. So he put it down, and he proved that the federal government had the ability and the will to enforce the law. The other folks he had to deal with, though, are people that we'd been fighting with and would continue to fight with throughout our expansion west, and that would be the native tribes. The native tribes have been pushed further and further west. We've made treaties with them, and again and again we've broken those treaties, and we'll continue to do so. A chief by the name of Little Turtle convinced the other tribes in the Ohio Valley, look, we've all got to team up if we're going to stop these Americans from expanding into our territory. And it worked. Little Turtle's alliance starts driving settlers from the area. We send an army out there. They ambush them. 
We send another army. They ambush them. He's doing well. Washington, though, is supposed to enforce American law, and our laws say that this land is ours. We do not respect uh, the natives' right to this land, and so we're going to send an army out there to secure this land and to put down this rebellion. And so he charges a former uh, officer in uh, the Continental Army, General Anthony Wayne, known as Mad Anthony Wayne because of his daring charges that he made. And so Wayne goes out there, but he doesn't act like the other uh, officers that have been out there and just start wandering around waiting to get ambushed. He establishes a fort. Then he moves further in. He establishes another base. And he's systematically securing the area. And Little Turtle takes a look at what he's doing. He's saying, we're not going to beat him. Let's negotiate now and get the best treaty we can. The other chiefs were kind of full of themselves, says, nah, we're winning. We're not going to negotiate. So they kept fighting until they were defeated at the Battle of Fallen Timbers. And then they had to negotiate and sign a treaty where they totally lost. And they gave up the region and were moved further west. This was Washington uh, enforcing our sovereignty over the area that we claimed and uh, keeping the peace on the frontier. Well, Washington ends up serving two terms. He serves for four years. We ask him, please, serve one more term. You're the guy we need. And so he serves four more years. Now, this didn't mean he didn't have his detractors. He was caught between two political parties. And quite frankly, if you're going to label him, his policies tend to favor the Federalists, though he would never himself say, I'm a Federalist or I'm a Jeffersonian or Republican. I am an American. This is how he feels. He does not like our political divisions. But after two terms of office, people ask him to run again. But he says no. He sees that by stepping down, he will set a precedent, which is important in our country, that nobody should be president for life. Even though you could get elected president for life, that's a bad, bad policy. We need to have a peaceful exchange of power. And he decides to step down, and he sets the precedent that all the presidents in the future are going to follow up until Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1940s. So Washington steps down. As he's leaving, Washington gives a famous farewell address, and in it, he warns America about the problems he sees facing us. Number one, the world's a dangerous place and we're a young country. Stay out of foreign wars. Don't make alliances that are going to drag you into trouble. Secondly, don't divide yourselves. You're Americans. You're not Northerners. You're not Southerners. You're not Federalists. You're not Democratic Republicans. You're Americans. Don't divide yourselves, of course. In neither one of these uh, forms of advice do we end up following um, what he recommends. Instead, we're going to entangle ourselves in foreign affairs. Of course, in the modern era, you really can't avoid it. And we are going to become very politically divided. But uh, this was what Washington had hoped to avoid.